So how about some camp whispers and intel from all across the country, coast to coast? I want to start at Ohio State. This won't last long. But I opened up the inbox this morning when I was getting ready for the Late Kick Extra podcast, and I had some viewer questions about Ohio State's quarterback situation. And they were asking me, essentially, I'm hearing some really good things about Kyle McCord. Does this change your thinking about the pecking order in Columbus at the quarterback position? No, it doesn't at all. You're going to hear some very good things about Kyle McCord. I'm going to tell you why. Because Kyle McCord's a very good quarterback. He would start at most places in America. But this is not Kyle McCord's job. This is going to be C.J. Stroud's job. Of that, I am very, very confident. And I don't think you'll find many people of any rapport who follow Ohio State who are going to try and suggest otherwise to you. So they've got scrimmages coming up too. Okay, but let me take you back to the words out of the head coach's mouth there. These are Ryan Day's paraphrased words, not mine. He has told people since the start of camp they plan on or hope to be able to name a starter at quarterback after the first scrimmage or after the first couple of weeks of camp. In my experience, coaches never say that voluntarily unless they're already 95% sure themselves. Because think about what you're setting yourself up to do. What if it's indecisive? What if it's neck and neck and, and you've just gone ahead and put yourself out there again on your own volition and said, I'm going to name one after the first week, after the first two weeks, after the first scrimmage. He knows who it's going to be. I think he, number one, wants competition, which he's got. And number two, let's be real, he wants to keep as many of these quarterbacks on his roster as long as he can. So, no, I don't have any questions about the Ohio State quarterback situation. I will say this, though. How is it possible I have a hair in my eye right now? I have none naturally. Colin, where did that come from? Who's been? No one's been in here. All right, well, I want to get back on track now. So someone's hair other than mine was in my eye. I've seen the phrase quarterback controversy again. This is a dirty phrase. We don't believe in this on this show. But I've seen it floating around again. And I would like for someone to explain to me, this is rhetorical, because hair notwithstanding, there's no one else in this studio right now, but I would like for someone to explain to me what a quarterback controversy is. And why don't we have wide receiver controversies? Why do we never have safety controversies? We only have competition at those positions. But at quarterback, sometimes we have quarterback controversies. Now, if you're running a website out there and it is, it is imperative that you generate a minimum amount of clicks per day, okay, call it a controversy all you want to. But for the real ones in the room, what are we talking about when we say quarterback controversy? It's competition. There's nothing bad that's happening at Ohio State right now because they have multiple guys good enough to start. All right, let's move on. I do question how Florida State's going to handle their quarterback situation. If so I was texting back and forth with a buddy down – Lives very near Tallahassee, not exactly in Tallahassee. Close to the program, though. He pays for that access, but he's very close to the program. And so we've been going back and forth all summer about Mackenzie Milton. I've spoken my piece on him here. I think ultimately he's going to give them the best chance to win football games. But at the same time, offensive tackle is going to be a weakness for this team this year. Let's just put it out there and state it like it is. Uh, This is not a team that has the kind of depth at that position to where even at their maximum potential, that's ever going to become a strength for them. Now, everybody's got strengths and weaknesses, relatively speaking. Some are more glaring than others. But having stated that, it makes your quarterback vulnerable. Anytime you got weaknesses at tackle, it makes your quarterback vulnerable. And then you add into that the context that Mackenzie Milton is coming off a devastating injury. Now, much like Derek King down at Miami, We've heard all the right things about him. Even back in spring, we saw him move around. So it's not like anyone is chewing their fingernails down to the nubs, worrying about whether he can walk upright. But at the same time, having watched the history of this game, as you and I have, you know it makes you nervous. The first time you see a free rusher, not in a spring game where they're going to blow the whistle, and not in practice where it's not live bullets and it's a touch and it's a blow the play dead. This, in the fall, when Notre Dame is on the field with you 10 minutes into the first quarter, they're trying to knock your head off, figuratively. We don't want to win kicked out of a game. But they're trying to assault you at quarterback. They want to knock you out of the game. And so then it becomes real. And that's where the whole quarterback rotation possibly fits in here because the other situation to keep an eye on is Jordan Travis is having a really good camp for Florida State. And it's been a net positive positive for Jordan Travis no matter if he wins this job outright or not. Two positives there. Number one, this coaching staff has been a godsend for him, uh, both physically and mentally. And number two, I think Mackenzie Milton's been a godsend for him because not only do you have culturally just an infinitely better and less toxic environment for a quarterback to exist in, but you've got real premium competition there at the position. And 
a quarter, any, any player worth his salt, quarterback or otherwise, will tell you competition never made a mentally tough guy worse. It only made him better. And so I think he is the latter instead of the former of that descriptor. And so I'm thinking to myself, if Jordan Travis does indeed progress throughout this camp and put on a good showing, even if he's not matching McKenzie Milton throw for throw, even if he's not grading out A for A with McKenzie Milton, given what the potential slight limitation may be on McKenzie Milton if he wins that job, I think it's ludicrous uh, to be surprised if both of these guys are worked into the rotation there at Florida State. I absolutely think both of them will play uh, and play a lot this year. And that is injury or not, even if they're both healthy. Now I want to shift it, stay in the ACC for a second, but shift it to Clemson. Talked about this the other day, but since some Clemson fans think that I'm out with torch and pitchfork in hand to get them, we really got to lather them up in the preseason here. There are a couple of fan bases that I just have to handle differently, and Clemson's one of them because I cannot pronounce the name right. So that's already strike one. Strike two is a lot of Clemson folks think that the world's out to get them. I got a lot of Clemson buddies, and I'm talking directly to them right now. They know good and well who they are, and they know this in their heart to be true. So having said that, let me just tell you how much I love Clemson for a second, specifically the wide receiver position. It is no breaking news that they've got a lot of talent at receiver. It's the length. It's the, it's the, it's the wingspan. Like they, You can't fit the edges of the fingers on camera. Neither can I. I'm not starting at receiver for Clemson. I can assure you of that. So I put out a tweet today, and I was just marveling at the overall length in the receiver room. Good. Jesse's got it up. Jesse, by the way, is punching the show tonight from Connecticut. We've taken a break from Fort Lauderdale, giving those guys and girls the day off. We shifted our operation up to Connecticut, which has confused many of you because I am in Nashville, but we're just we're beaming this thing all over the place to get it to you live. Look at the length on this chart, though. If you're listening on the podcast, let me read these names to you. Justin Ross is 6'4", 205. E.J. Williams, 6'3", 190. Both of them hail from Phoenix City, Alabama, by the way. Shout out, Phoenix City. Uh, Frank Ladson is 6'3", 205. Ngata is 6'3", 220. Aju Aju, bless you, is 6'3", 220. There's not a guy in their receiver room that's going to see serious minutes this year that's under 6'3". Now, compare that, rather with what Bama's been like the last couple of years, and they had the best receiver room by a mile in the country and sent four of them to the first round, and none of those guys were over 6'1", which just goes to show you there are several different ways still to skin the old wide receiver cat. But if you look at the B-roll, which is a fancy term for this really slow-motion three-year-old footage we're showing right now, it's three years old for a reason. Well, the first highlight was it was the length on display in the 2018 title game that we were discussing the other night where those 30, 70 balls were getting caught and caught and caught, and all of a sudden, Bama's getting beat by four touchdowns by Clemson. How is that? Well, elite receiver play. That's how it was. And I'm having a really hard time not picking Clemson to win the national championship this year. This is not official, so this is just between you and I. Don't tell the folks that run our desk or CBSSports.com because I'm not ready to turn my picks in yet. But I'm... I'm leaning towards Clemson to win the national championship right now. Now, that would buy me, I think, a lot of credibility up there. Lastly, I want to go to Ann Arbor, and I want to talk about a guy that, as we sat here on National Signing Day, we were talking a whole lot about. Remember Donovan Edwards? It was Wilt Fong in here. Uh, I think Trey Scott was over in the nether regions of the edge of the studio. Uh, No, we had Trey on air that day, didn't we, Colin? And we had Director Colin, as always, on the ones and twos in there. But there was a guy we talked about a lot. After we got off the air, we said, did we do like seven Donovan Edwards segments? Well, we kind of did because we thought he was going to be a big deal. And then subsequently on Late Kick, I talked about him a lot. This is a four-star, high four-star, true freshman running back. You see his bio if you're watching here on YouTube. He chose Michigan over Notre Dame, among other programs. This was a really, really big get. At the time, they'd gotten Xavier Worthy. Now, since then, he's gone on to Texas. But they got Donovan Edwards to go to Michigan. And so... The reason I made such a big deal about him is because we had people behind the scenes telling us there is zero chance, unless he, unless he stubs a toe or he's got an ingrown toenail or a lot of toe issues, apparently, unless he hurts himself, he's going to be playing very early for them because he's one of the most college-ready backs you'll ever see. From the neck up, he's totally there. Physically, he's totally there. He's, he's 5'11", 190, put together really, really well, and he's a complete back. There aren't glaring weaknesses to his game. And he's going to Michigan, where they need guys like that. Well, sure enough, early on in camp at Michigan, that's all anyone wants to talk about. They want to talk about Donovan Edwards, and there are two things that stand out about him. 
really if you talk to people close to the program up there. One is skill set, but number two is total self-starter. He's the kind of guy, sometimes I make this comparison, in the atmospheric science world, we have closed, cold core lows sometimes, and they're very unique. One of the only chances you're going to get snow in the south is if one of those rogue systems comes through. But what's so fascinating about it from a meteorological perspective is they provide their own cold air. They can be 70 degrees all around them, but that little system can be pumping 32 degree air in itself and it can make its own cold air. It doesn't come from Canada or anywhere else. Well, that's kind of how folks like Donovan Edwards are. When they walk in a room, you could be in an office building and know someone like this. You can be in a football complex and know someone like this. They don't need motivation externally. They don't need you to pump them up. They don't need you to disrespect them before they get angry. Uh, they don't need to see anybody else. They don't need to be led. They are leaders. It's intrinsic. It's in them. And when those kinds of guys walk in the door, I don't care if they're 18 years old or 22 years old, true freshman or senior, they impact the rest of your program. Donovan Edwards, from the day he's been on campus at Ann Arbor, has started to impact the Michigan program. Now, in an ideal world, you got several guys like that, but you take as many of them as you can get, and Donovan Edwards is a really good one. So you're going to watch Michigan play early in the season. They got that big game against Washington in week two, which is the first time most of you will watch them. Watch for Donovan Edwards, true freshman running back.